And a special welcome to everyone that's here today. And so as we continue with week two of our selfless series, we're going to be taking our scripture reading today from Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 4, which reads as follows. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should, not, should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. So, as we read in our scripture reading, which comes from Philippi, um, I mean Philippians, Paul is writing to this congregation in Philippi. And the reason he writes for them is because, one, um, when he writes to them, rather, what was happening is that there were divisions in the congregation. So this is a group of Christians, there were division amongst them, but also, what Paul then goes on to speak about, which we will explore, is that those divisions were actually caused by people pursuing their selfish interests. And Paul has somehow diagnosed that the selfish interest, pursuing selfish interests, is the reason for this division. Pursuing selfish interests was actually the reason for this division. At the time of writing, Paul actually draws from his own experience in order to help them realize how the opposite is more helpful. So to give you a bit of background, Paul is actually writing, we're not certain of the location, but one thing we do know is that at the time of writing, Paul was in prison. We're not certain as to which prison he was in. Some people say it might have been in Rome and all of that, but one thing that we are certain of, because that's what he wrote, is that he's actually in a prison. And obviously, as a typical missionary in those days where it was somehow not allowed to be preaching the gospel because, remember, those, in those days, people who lived in the Roman Empire would have been, they would have held Caesar in high regard and somewhat worshipped him. And so when someone came through with a different teaching and they said, worship God, worship Jesus Christ, they felt as though the two stood out head on against each other, and it was as though you were denouncing the Caesar. And so Paul has been in prison for preaching the gospel, and he knew that one of the possibilities that came with him being in prison was that he could potentially be executed to death. He could have been potentially be executed through death, rather. He could have been killed. It's either he would have been released, and he would have made it out, and he would have told the story, or he would have been killed. So he was not, he knew all of this. This is not the first time that Paul has been imprisoned. In actual fact, Roman Empire prisons were ruthless. I know when we read in Acts, it tells us about how Paul and his companion were actually flogged after they had been imprisoned for preaching the gospel. They were whooped so badly. And so again, Paul finds himself in a similar position. Once again, in prison. But when then Paul goes on to write about his experience in prison, writing to this congregation, the Philippians, he says to them, I would actually prefer to die because of the circumstances I find myself in. Death would have obviously retreated him from this persecution that he was facing. I don't know if you've, if you've been in so much pain that you thought to yourself, man, I could choose death over this. And so Paul says, I would rather die. And he says, in actual fact, even if I do die, it's a gain for me because I'm going to be with God. It's a much better place. But he says, but instead of death, even though death is probably the better option, but I desire to live so that I can serve 
even more. What Paul is doing here, he's not saying, you know, often when people are asking for another shot at life, they're like, I want to live so that I can do the things I didn't do. I want to live so that I can probably go collect all my debts. There's people who owe me, so I can't die with people that owe me. I want to live so that I can do one, two, three. I have not finished my bucket list. But Paul actually turns it upside down and he says, he doesn't say, I want to live because these things I want to do. He does not say, I want to live because I still want to catch up with life. He does not say, I want to live because there's goals that I've not accomplished yet. Personal goals. But Paul actually says, I want to live so that I can serve more. He says, death could be a, lot, a much better option in comparison to the pain that I am going through right now, in comparison to being left in a Roman prison where the persecution is really bad. But he says, death is a better option because then I will go off and sit with my Lord. But I must all of this, I desire to live so that I can serve you guys even more. And in this part of the Bible, we somehow come across the African philosophy of Ubuntu, which actually speaks about your livelihood enabling you living for the benefit of others. And so, when Paul draws on his experience and he retells his experience and he tells the Philippians why he actually wants to live, he's drawing them to his own life and experience as a point of reference. And it's as though he's saying, be selfless like I am because this will unite you. It will restore unity amongst all of you guys as opposed to pursuing selfish interests. Be selfless as I am. You see, when we pursue selfish interest, our interests are at loggerhead against one another and it becomes difficult to wish well for one another. When we pursue selfish interests, our interests are at rivalry against one another. They're fighting for the spotlight. They're fighting for the win. And therefore, it becomes impossible to wish well for the next person. And this is why Paul then draws them to his life and is like, guys, I'm selfless. I do not want to live because of my selfish interests. But my reason, my desire for living is fueled by my interest for your well-being. And then Paul then encourages them as fellow worshipers who draw from the same source to do likewise. And it is in this context that we find the words that we read. After he has said, he's spoken about his own experience and he has drawn them to his kind of selflessness. He then goes on to say, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider each other better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. And so it is at the backdrop of this context that Paul then speaks these words. And then after this, we then begin to realize when we read this particular words, that as I've said, selfishness puts our needs against one another. So when I'm selfish and the next person is selfish, it is difficult for me to say, I'm going to look out for you because I'm selfish. I want to achieve what I want to achieve. They want to achieve what they want to achieve. Why should I care about them? And that is the problem with selfishness. Whereas selfishness, selflessness does the opposite. It helps us to establish some sort of harmony because whatever I do, I do it with your best interest at heart. And so I would not wish you bad. 
I would not wish ill for you. I would want to see you succeed. The minute you do something and it works out well, I rejoice in your success because it affirms the reason I live and that is your well-being. And in the same manner, you do it for the next person, and that next person does it for me. It establishes this nice cycle where people are just in this harmonious relationship where they're just looking out for each other, and they're living for one another. And that is the natural order of things that God has created. When you look at our relationship with nature, It is in such a way that we look out for nature, I plant the tree, I look after the tree, I eat from the tree, it gives me oxygen. We've got this beautiful relationship with nature that is also meant to exist amongst us. But often selfishness robs us of this reality. Selfishness makes other people a threat. That is another problem with selfishness. When we're all pursuing our own self-interest, suddenly we do not wish well for the next person. Because it's all about how much can I achieve? And when they achieve more than you do, when their interests are, when they're able to achieve, then it feels as though they've taken something away from you because your interests are at loggerheads against one another. A typical example is if one is selfish in the workplace and it's always about them getting the spotlight. You know, you, got, you get those people that are just, they just become very grumpy and awkward when the next person gets the spotlight. It's like, what are you doing in my spotlight? And that's what selfishness does to us. When the next person gets the spotlight, when the next person succeeds, when the next person is making it in life, We feel as though they're taking something away from us because we are selfish. It's meant to be about us. How dare they step into our zone? Everyone's life must be circled around us, must evolve around us. And that's what selfishness does. We don't want to see anyone else succeed. And as a result, we become rivals. And that's why selfishness and unity can never coexist. But rather, it is the opposite When one is out looking for the next person, when your friend gets a promotion, when your friend is affirmed at work, when your friend is making it at work, you begin to affirm them and you look out for them. You rejoice in their success and you are happy when things are working out well in their lives because you are selfless. This is what you exist for, to see other people thrive. And so, in trying to draw this point further, in chapter 2, later on, we come across Paul pointing them to Jesus as the source of this level of selflessness. That Jesus actually modeled this perfectly for us. Paul then begins to describe how Jesus gave up his heavenly riches in order to be amongst us as human beings. How Jesus did not walk around like a king that is meant to be worshipped or rather this king that, that everyone must just pause and just worship and just look at in a very unhealthy manner. But Jesus came through, was selfless, gave up his heavenly status. And as much as Jesus was a king that needed to be worshipped, Jesus was out there helping people, washing people's feet. In olden day, in Israel, in the olden days, what used to happen is that when an important guest would come into your household, you would wash their feet. But you find Jesus actually doing the opposite to his disciples, and he's instead washing their feet. And Paul then describes to the Philippians that Jesus was all about selflessness. His life was not about his own interest, but he literally died so that he could enable the next person to live beyond their sin. And this is what Paul actually draws us to. He says, this guy was majestic, but he gave up his life. He gave up his position as a king so that he could pursue a life that enables the next person to live. And it is the selflessness of Jesus that reconciled us to Jesus irrespective of our sin. And you see, the thing about selflessness is that It is such a powerful principle that it unites us with people even when it's impossible for us to be united with them. 
Because our life is no longer about ourselves, but it is about seeing the next person thrive in life. Even when it was impossible for us to be united with Jesus, selflessness enabled us. And this is what the whole philosophy of Ubuntu is about. It says your breathing should be affirmed by you seeing the next person breathe. You are human. And at the heart of the human nature is a soul that exists to to enable the next person to live. And then Paul does something very powerful to show them that this principle is not something that is far-fetched. Because they could have obviously looked at him and thought to themselves, well, let's see, Mr. Paul, you've been a Jewish scholar for so many years. You've been writing the Bible. You had a personal encounter with God. Obviously, it's easy for you to be selfless. They could then go on to say, You've used Jesus as an example. Come on. We all know that Jesus is God and is human. How can we live up to those expectations? We are only normal Christians. Aren't we tempted to say that at times? But Paul even drives the point further in chapter 3 when he goes on to point them to two people whom they would have been deeply familiar with. One, he draws them to Timothy. Now, Timothy was like a son to Paul. And then Paul says about Timothy, he points them to the fact that Timothy is so committed to serving Paul. He's so committed to the mission. He's so committed to serving God and serving alongside with Paul. And because of this, him and Timothy are strongly united. It is Timothy's selflessness that enabled Timothy and Paul to establish such a strong connection. That even though Timothy is a gifted preacher, a gifted teacher, someone with beautiful spiritual gifts, he used those gifts to enable Paul's mission. And you see this harmonious relationship that is being established, and it also goes to Paul then serving congregations and so on and so on. And Paul then also has this harmonious relationship with Timothy because he's also a mentor to Timothy. And then he points them also to the person who was the recipient of that letter, who would then take this letter and take it back to the congregation whom he was writing it for and give it to them. He then points them to this guy, Epaphroditus. And you see, he says, he explains that firstly, on his mission to go to Paul as he was sent by this congregation while Paul was in prison, Epaphroditus fell sick to the point that he was, or he almost died. And Paul points them to this particular point that even though he almost died, he never gave up on the mission. You see, often when you're serving people and you find yourself in compromised situations, the temptation is to say, snap, this is just too much. I'm bailing out. But he points them to the fact that even though he almost died, he did not bail out. But he continued serving. One cannot achieve that without selflessness. Because the minute you get sick, the minute you compromise, the minute you find yourself in a difficult situation while doing something for someone else, selfishness always creeps in at that moment and it says, it's too risky. Get out of here. But when there's selflessness, obviously, while applying wisdom, you are able to see it through because your life finds its true meaning in you being able to enable others to do life. And so Paul points them to people amongst them. He says, you guys can do it. And then Paul closes off the letter in a way that is so beautiful. He then affirms how he's seen them, how he's seen glimpses of faith, of selflessness in their own lives. When Epaphroditus came to Paul to visit him in prison, he comes to Paul with giving, with offering from that congregation to say, dude, listen, we know you're in a difficult situation, but we want to enable your mission because we know that once we've enabled your mission, It's going to go a long way. 
many more lives are going to be saved. And in chapter 4, Paul is thanking them. And in typical Paul fashion, he wants to say to them, you know, it's whenever you read about Paul and Every time it's got something to do with offering, he always kind of puts in a side note there that, by the way, I had my own tent making skill, you know, so I wasn't that, de- you know, so he always kind of throws it in there. And in typical for Paul fashion, he says, I'm not writing this because I am asking you guys uh, for money. I'm not writing this because I want you guys to give, but I really want to thank you. You see, the congregation recognized that one, Paul is in prison. And it means that even though Paul was a tent maker and he somehow sponsored his own life alongside whatever help he received. But they realized that in prison, there's no way he'd be able to make money. And unfortunately, mission required money. And so they bought, they sent with Epaphroditus money to sponsor mission. And Paul affirms this level of selflessness. You see, Why is it selfless? It's because there was no legal obligation for them to actually give to Paul's mission. In actual fact, in a because the Philippians were situated in a Roman state, there were legal obligations for them to pay taxes. They were legally obliged to pay taxes to the Caesar. And so anyone would have said, Hmm, Let me see. If I worship this God, God is cool because there's no taxes required. I'll just pay to Caesar, but I'm not going to add another burden onto my own life. That's usually the logic. But because of their selflessness, they decided to enable Paul's mission, which would further go into this harmonious cycle where they enable another person in order so that they can enable mission. Mission enables people to live. It is almost like that woman whom the disciples wanted to call into order. You remember when we go towards Easter, we often speak about the woman that broke the alabaster jar and anointed Jesus. You remember that? And at that moment, Judas is like, what are you doing? We could have used this money in a way that was smarter, in a way that was much more wise. And there's always that temptation to say we could do better with money as opposed to using it to enable something. But Jesus then stops Judas at that moment. He says, she knows something you do not. She's preparing me for my death. In keeping with Jewish custom, what she was doing, she was anointing this body that would then be buried for three days. But this body that she was anointing would rise on the day of resurrection. It would wake up, it would come out of the tomb, and human beings would realize a new way of living. It was 350 denarii that was wasted, a whole year's worth of wage. That's how much that perfume cost. But it went towards a great mission. It seemed as though it was waste. But for one who does not know how grateful she was for what God did, it just would not make sense. And at that moment, she literally sits at Jesus' feet and she pours out this perfume, even though it does not make sense. Selflessness will make you look crazy. Selflessness will make you make, do things that people just cannot rationalize. Even though the God was not like Caesar and required a tax in order for them to belong to God. But out of selflessness, they decided to enable God's mission. And it is that which made their offering a sweet and pleasing sacrifice to God. Because it came from a heart that desired to enable mission. And so as the worship team just joins us as we wrap up in prayer, I want you to think about this whole thing of selflessness. It can, be, it can manifest in various ways. How can you be selfless in the workplace? How can you make sure that you are no longer offended by someone else getting the spotlight? How can you be offended? Maybe it's at home. It's a sibling rivalry. How can we change that around? And that you begin celebrating your sibling because... You exist to enable their success and their life. Maybe it's a spouse, whatever it may be. I don't know who it is that you've maybe fought for the spotlight with. 
But I want to challenge you and say selfishness always breaks relationships. But selflessness unites us at a much deeper level. Let us pray together. And so God, we thank you for the gift of selflessness. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you modeled such a powerful principle for us. And we pray, God, that as we apply this in our lives, that you give us the strength and the wisdom to do this. We pray, God, that as we acknowledge this, Lord, that as we go into the week, that we may be your hands and feet, that we may truly lay our lives for you to put us to use as you desire. We are thankful, God, and we pray for all of this. In your mighty and in your powerful name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.